School. When you're a kid, you hate it. When you're an adult, you hate it and you can't afford it. Educated people have more skills to sell to employers and ultimately to customers, so there is value in education. We all agree. It's preferable that as many people as possible be educated. The question remains, how do we educate people? Are there even people who should be educated? The Infographics Show thinks they know exactly how education should be given and are going to tell us what happens if their preferred model disappears. Ah, another being with propaganda infesting their realm. Let me help you tear this piece to shreds. Where did you, uh, forget it. I go through dimensional locks like coffee filters anyhow. Let's just see what they've got. Oh hi, I'm the heretic. Hit it! Compulsory education is the norm across nearly every society on Earth. Here in the US, most states force kids to go to school from ages 5 to at a minimum 16, but some require children to stay in school until 18 after they've completed a full high school education. Well, I wasn't expecting that level of honesty. I mean, they outright say that these kids are forced into these schools for almost all their childhood years. However, I do want to touch up on something. These state-enforced institutions are not the only option. One can also be homeschooled or sent to a private school. However, here's the juicy part. If a child is homeschooled, they still have to follow specific state guidelines, and if you send your child to a private school, you are not just paying for the private school, but you are also still forced to fund the state education system through taxation. Essentially, parents sending their kids to private schools have to pay twice. Ain't that sweet. To say nothing of how private schools need certification from the state and can only hire teachers the state gives permission to teach. If you think such teachers could be critical of the state, just think about this logically. Could the manager of a McDonald's be critical of McDonald's? Of course not. What would happen though if not just primary schools, but universities and technical institutes all disappeared? If the government schooling system disappeared, then all necessary components of government education would have to go away also. Government required certification for teachers or accreditation both for schoolhouses and universities. Even private and charter schools require approval from the government to be able to teach and must hire government-approved teachers. Let's not even get into the utter cesspool that is colleges and universities. If you don't get rid of these things, then resources will just be being wasted for something that doesn't even exist. It's like training for years to become an expert at riding unicorns. As for trade schools, many U.S. states require workers entering trades to attend a year or so of trade school. You need to remove these requirements if trade schools are disappearing, otherwise it's impossible to legally enter the profession. Unless your intent is to make your point by causing as much suffering as possible, then it only serves to make our argument against government barriers to employment. So after all the hoops are jumped through, what happens then? The most important thing that will happen if schools disappeared is that people will figure out that schooling does not mean education and that there are other ways to educate people. Now I can already hear the screeching from across the dimensions. How can we have any quality control if there is not standardization? This is why we need government. Re. This has been debunked in many fields over and over again, so allow me to beat the proverbial dead horse. The market can easily provide. One simply has to have a basic knowledge of supply and demand. If you have a business, in this case a private school, that is not keeping up with the latest innovations or teaching faulty information, the results will speak for themselves. Their results will fall behind more efficient schools, and both students and parents alike will be able to see this and want to be enrolled in better schools with more options. The failing school will have less enrollment, lose more money, and either have to change their practices or risk going out of business. This isn't even taking into consideration things such as review firms and businesses meant to hold other businesses to higher standards. Sure, schools don't have to hire these firms, but it is in their best interest to do so to ensure full enrollment and avoid turnout. Public schools have the exact opposite set of incentives. They actively incentivize bad behavior and mediocrity, and the worse it does, the more the government will say, these schools are failing because they don't get enough funding. Please allow us to collect more from you. Don't fall for this nonsense. 
In essence, capitalizing on this evolutionary adaptation from our hunter-gatherer days is the entire job of a school. And if you just took this platitude at face value and didn't bother to think critically, it would be easy to reach this conclusion. However, if one was to take even the most cursory of glances at the history of education, you would find that this is absolutely not the case. The modern school systems across the world follow the Prussian model, which was not meant to raise an educated populace, but to indoctrinate and create obedient, subservient workers and soldiers. All you have to do is look in any modern classroom. Desk all arranged in symmetrical order. Don't get up unless excused. Don't speak unless called upon. All this while being fed information filtered through the lens of the state being the be-all, end-all entity that ties your society together. Something that is patently untrue. The system was developed by Johann Gottlieb Fichte. I'll let him speak for himself. Education should aim at destroying free will, so that, after pupils have left school, they shall be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. If capitalizing on humanity's ability to learn through example is what you want to do, schools, especially those that rely on the Prussian model, were never designed to. But there are ways to do that. We'll touch on them later. Do continue. But schools also have another important function, innovating more efficient ways of transferring knowledge from generation to generation. This is why education curriculums are always changing and adapting. Changing and adapting, oh yes, because our classroom's still looking like a factory setting in the information ages, innovating new ways to absorb information. Giving children new tools will not fix the state's inherent inability to innovate. The state, at its best, will always be years behind the newest innovations in the market because the state does not have the ability to discern when these new innovations are necessary. It's called the economic calculation problem, and it's the reason why the price mechanism is such a miraculous thing. While school districts and curriculum are ultimately designed by school board and state departments of education, the U.S. Department of Education creates bad incentives through the creation of grants given to school districts who meet adequate yearly progress standards required under the No Child Left Behind Act. Progress, in this case, is defined as performance on standardized tests. Failure to meet AYP standards means a school district loses out on federal grants, and should they fail five years in a row, result in schools being shut down. Furthermore, it's not the school's incentive to improve curriculum or education, but to teach to the test. Associate Professor for the College of Education in the University of Maryland, Linda Valley, did a study of the effects of No Child Left Behind. In her words, it actually undermined the quality of teaching in reading and math from the pressure teachers were feeling to teach to the test. This isn't even getting into Common Core. Its use of curriculum is designed specifically to drive a wedge in families. After all, what parent can make sense of what is happening on their hatchlings' homework? As if that wasn't bad enough, the way students are being sexualized as part of the curriculum is just... Just, just listen to this. From page 6 of the National Sexuality Education Standards of 2012. The National Sexuality Education Standards were further informed by the work of the CDC's Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool, existing state and international education standards that, in that include sexual health content. The Guidelines for Comprehensive Sexuality Education, Kindergarten through 12th Grade, and the Common Core State Standards for English, Language Arts, and Mathematics recently adopted by most states. The link for the PDF is in the description. These people are integrating sexuality into the curriculum as early as kindergarten, and it's built into English and math subjects. The stuff you can find on the internet is bad enough, but what we aren't seeing that's being taught in these common core classrooms could be far worse than any one of us could possibly imagine. Now, how was common core implemented? The stimulus package of 2009 included roughly a billion dollars to the U.S. Department of Education to create a program called Race to the Top. The 46 that took a dime of Race to the Top money were required to implement Common Core standards as a stipulation of receiving that money. So no, curriculum change has nothing to do with any experimentation on the school's part and everything to do with the United States Department of Education bribing states into implementing federal curriculum 
that was probably designed by pedophiles. And why, despite our technology growing by leaps and bounds, the human brain can still keep up with new developments and discoveries without falling behind. It's a feature of the brain to take shortcuts. We don't need to know how a steam engine works to know how a combustion engine works, and we don't need to know how either works to drive a car. Children, toddlers can figure out how to use a smartphone, so clearly yes, we can use technology infinitely more complex than what could have been conceived of a few hundred years ago. What's missing is why we need schooling to teach us this, or even how they could do it. My time in government school never taught me how to use a smartphone or drive a car. Or you can look at the PC boom of the mid-90s. Many people started buying up home PCs, but these were much more simple compared to the computing power of modern systems. Despite the simplicity, many young children took up the task to learn how to gain the most usefulness from these PCs, to the point where in many middle-class homes the children knew more of the ins and outs of this technology than their parents did. A child's mind is like a sponge, and if you let their curiosity take over, they can surprise you with what they can learn on their own. These children grew up with technology, and when they became adults, they went on to front the cutting edge of technology that would push us into the future. In a matter of 20 years' time, we now have tablets and phones that can take care of every aspect of our business and run complex algorithms that would have seemed like Star Trek technology even back in the turn of the millennium. The first and most immediate side effect would be a catastrophic global brain drain. Our modern and high-tech society relies on hundreds of different technical specialties just to keep things running. Without a robust education system in place, individuals would have to be trained on the job, drastically slowing the rate of technological and cultural advancement. If you got rid of education, of course there would be a huge brain drain. But this video isn't about if a robust educational system disappeared. It's about if schools disappeared. This is a language trick. The infographic show is conflating schooling with education, and quite frankly, it's dishonest sophistry. This intensive hands-on training would also lead to a contraction of technology across society as qualified individuals required to run our computer networks, power plants, and the million other jobs that make modern society possible would have to be painstakingly taught starting all the way back at the fundamentals, things like basic algebra, biology, or history. If I may, there is another problem with this concept right out of the gate. The human brain is an amazing piece of machinery, and the human condition is to be curious about the world we have been placed in. Even if we were to erase all memory of teaching as a concept, humanity would eventually build it right back up because this is what we do. It is built into our DNA to want to unravel the mysteries of our existence, and it is just as much a part of us to want to pass down what has been learned and to build on what we have already established to be true. The only way one could ever destroy the concept of seeking knowledge is to rewire our brain to go against what we were involved into higher cognitive beings to do. We've already established that there's value in education. People are going to be educated, they're going to want to be educated, and parents will want their hatchlings educated. They might not be educated in the way you want, but they'll be educated. Without schools, our society would be unable to keep up with the intellectual demands of current and new technologies. Instead, we would be forced to abandon most of our technologies and revert back to a more primitive and simpler age without as heavy intellectual demands placed on the individual. Supply and demand would mean even if there were the threat of technological aggression, then the people who had the skills to build or simply maintain advanced technology would skyrocket. Entrepreneurs would jump at the chance to obtain the skills for themselves, or even develop alternatives. The price mechanism would solve the problems for us, because it's so lucrative for people to do so. Here's where the infographic show really goes off the deep end. Even if we were to completely destroy all educational systems, public and private, we would still have the vast amount of information left behind at our fingertips. We do not live in some Fallout-style post-apocalyptic nuclear hellhole. We still have uncountable books on every subject. We still have the internet. We still have all these vast amounts of resources at the ready, just waiting to be put to good use. No, a halt in government intervention would not take us back to some primitive era, but government intervention itself, in every aspect in our lives, and in control of tools that could blast us back to the Stone Age, both militarily and economically, could easily take us back to the natural state of savagery. 
While formal education would disappear, it is likely that we would instead see the return of medieval era and later apprenticeships for most career fields, with children joining the workforce young so as, so as to learn lifelong skills necessary for their career field. Wait, so the highly technical and specialized roles needed to maintain our current level of technology would still exist? Except instead of institutional training, it'll be done through apprenticeships? The infographics show is undermining their own argument. What exactly is wrong with that? Most working class people aren't really able to be financially sustainable on their own until their late 20s to mid 30s. Even if we loosen some of these regulations on child labor, high school children could get a head start on building their career or establishing the work-school-life balance so necessary in this day and age. Also, aren't we forgetting something important here? Not everybody has to be a worker drone. People could start their own businesses. Imagine how much of a head start these children could get if they were able to start their own businesses without regulations and taxations getting in the way. It is possible, and kids nowadays are actually doing it already, even with all these restrictions in place. Then again, modern schools aren't in the business of empowering the individual anyways, in the day and age where simple things like lemonade stands must be shut down. Let's move on. Cars, airplanes, rockets, and other machines requiring years and years of engineering and scientific training would be a thing of the past, with humanity likely returning to the days of horses and plows. What nonsense! What absolute drivel! This is nothing but fear-mongering. If you claim this level of regression would happen, you need to back up this claim. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The infographic show isn't even close to finished being crazy, though. You already have to go through years and years of training today to become certified and experienced enough in the trades before the government will allow you to sell your services as an independent contractor. The infographics show is worried about something happening that is already happening today. But with the disappearance of schools, there too would be a disappearance of choice and personal freedom, as individuals would be forced to select an apprenticeship only within the jobs immediately available to them. In America alone, 290,000 students choose to study abroad, and almost a million students from other nations come to the USA to seek better educational opportunities. This. This is the height of where we have been indoctrinated. Allow me to completely dismember this claim. Without state education, the freedom of choice would be limited? This not only shows a deep level of statism, but a clear and dangerous political bias. They are assuming that one would be limited in choice to their economic status and that would limit upward mobility. Let me make this crystal clear. It is not lack of regulations on the free market that traps people in specific economic positions. Even government doesn't have the power to stop everyone from upgrading their economic state. Every day people are participating in voluntary transactions where both parties walk away richer from the experience both in wealth and in mind. As difficult as many make it seem, it is really a simple concept, and with the exponential rise in decentralized technology, it is now easier than ever. All it takes is for one person to look at the world and think, how can I add value? How can I solve people's problems? With capitalism, you cannot become wealthy without first providing value to people. This is why it's so infuriating when people call capitalism greedy while proceeding to surrender their property to an entity that provides nothing and demands tribute while threatening the population with imprisonment and death if they do not comply. Keep an eye out on my channel, as I plan to make many videos about the concept of value in entrepreneurship. These individuals have the opportunity to leave their local communities behind and seek out education for career fields that might not be available at home. Without a school system in place, however, this would not be possible. Why not? Explain why non-schooling institutions of education wouldn't have a study abroad program. If we take the apprenticeship program example, there's no reason why differing companies in the same industry but across national lines wouldn't have a study abroad program for apprentices especially in our increasingly global economy. If choice is your concern, then the modern government schooling program makes no sense. In most states, students are required to attend a single school depending on their age and school district, and even if they are homeschooled or attend private school, their parents are still forced to pay property tax. In essence, they're compelled to pay for education twice.
for many families, they literally can't afford to keep their hatchlings away from government schools, no matter how horrible they might actually be, for example, in inner cities. A truly free market of education would offer the most choice, allow parents to pay for these institutions voluntarily, and have schools compete with one another for their parents' tuition money. They could experiment with new ways to teach students. The best systems will be the most valuable and the most widely implemented. Perhaps apprenticeships are the best way to teach skills. Instead of study periods where the school district forces hatchlings to learn a topic at a specific point in the day for a set amount of time, students learn what they're interested in, and are allowed to study it for as long as they want to. And if you're worried about price, don't be. In the free market, price is going to be driven down. Even if you think the government should still manage schooling, Milton Friedman's proposal for school vouchers offers families tremendous choice, allowing them to send their hatchlings to the schools they want, their tax money paying said school, including charter and private schools. When a voucher lottery system was introduced in New York City and in Washington, D.C. to low-income families, the students who won these lotteries saw their college enrollment rate go up 24%. Perhaps the entire model of institutionalized education is completely obsolete, given the rise of the internet. Khan Academy is a non-for-profit online learning service that produces lesson plans and educational video on a huge number of topics all for free, funded through voluntary donations, allowing students to learn on demand and on their own schedules for as long as they want. There is also no shortage of educational videos on platforms like YouTube. Vsauce is a channel with 13 million subscribers covering a range of topics from psychology, physics, and human behavior. Though they haven't uploaded anything in six months, At the time of this recording, there is clearly a demand for decentralized education and a platform for people to compete with each other to put out the best information in the most compelling and entertaining way. Zoo Tears, for example, is a YouTube channel that explains zoology as if animals were character builds in an MMORPG. Terrible Writing Advice talks about storytelling and creative writing from the perspective of a character that is the worst writer, I mean the best writer in the world. Yours Truly explores philosophical and political topics. We're not even getting into tangential learning. Video games like Assassin's Creed can provoke interest in history. I myself wondered if a halo ring could be built in real life, minus the whole galactic genocide bit. The answer is yes, by the way. We just need a lot of materials. It would also be pretty small to avoid the problems of tensile strength. Even if you want to go low-tech, we're not abolishing libraries. Books will still exist, just saying. Point is, there are many options available for students to learn outside of schools. To say there's a limit of choice, let alone personal freedom without government schooling, is absurd. This isn't even taking into consideration synergy between schools and businesses. Many trade schools already have systems like this in place, where you go through their basic curriculum, and after you graduate from that, you can enter field-specific niches, where businesses in that niche provide hands-on experience, job placement, and extra incentives for going through courses with their seal of approval. It is in the direct interest of businesses for their new hires to be on the cutting edge of their field, so this is a win-win for both businesses and the schools. If you want a specific example, an automotive technical school called the Universal Technical Institute, or UTI for short, offers extended curriculum in the automotive field working directly with brands such as Ford and Porsche. They offer a diesel mechanic program working directly with Caterpillar and Cummins. They even have a motorcycle program working directly with Harley-Davidson. They do this while maintaining a specific level of performance standards that they must meet through independent organizations, such as the National Institute for Automotive Service Excellence, or ASE for short. All this from one technical school. The possibilities are limitless. So next time you're sitting in class, checking your phone, and complaining about having to be in school, remember that the cell phone in your hand, the satellite it connects to, and the rocket that got the satellite into orbit, 
all exist because of that very same classroom you're currently stuck in. Maybe it's time to turn that phone off and pay a little more attention in class, unless you're watching the infographic show, in which case you're probably already learning something really cool. It's a cliche that students hate school, but not one without merit. School is not designed to educate. It's designed to indoctrinate students, to condition them into unthinking automatons for whatever cause their masters wish them to fight and die for. Its institutions are geared around the careers of bureaucrats and the advancement of powerful people. It forces students into a regimented hierarchical institution that dictates what they learn, how much they learn, and how long they can study it. Forcing students to associate with bullies and others they would otherwise avoid but for the forced proximity of a classroom. It begs the question, whose preferences are being met by the government school system? It's definitely not the kids. I mean, after all, society treats its young worse than it treats animals. Why would society care what kids think? There are tens of millions of school-aged hatchlings in America, developing people who are being taught not how to think critically, look after themselves, provide for themselves, or defend themselves. They are being taught to happily surrender their freedom for the promise of security. We owe it to them, if not our future selves in the society the next generation will shape, the choice to not be forced into a one-size-fits-all indoctrination camp to be molded into pawns used to further the ambitions of totalitarian psychopaths. Why do students hate school? Because it sucks! Tangential learning will soon become the norm. The state education system will try to resist, but it is inevitable that the Prussian model will be innovated out of existence. We are in a new era of human understanding, and everything in our society shows it. We have new demands, new needs, new values, and beliefs. Young ones no longer value rigid and centralized education systems and resist it at every turn. Of course you have some that have difficulty applying themselves, but most want a challenge. They want to be entertained. They want to know their work is not completely wasted. They want to know this is actually worth their time investment. With education becoming more and more decentralized, young ones are finding the methods that help them achieve their goals the fastest, and these various decentralized platforms are competing in an open market for the attention of these kids' time. The state is doing everything in its power to rein in its inevitable demise, but the power of choice can conquer even the most monolithic structures. The study of economics is not just money, it's the study of choice, and as long as there are competing choices out there, people will seek what best suits their needs. If kids feel their time is more valuable watching YouTube videos or playing games on their phones rather than sitting still while being lectured at, what does that say about the quality of your product? The heretic is spot on. State education sucks! The world will be much better off the more people compete with it. Well, we're fairly confident schools won't be disappearing anytime soon, so until then, you'll have to keep on studying. If you want to learn how to study better so that you're not wasting precious time, we suggest taking a class over at Skillshare called Learn and Study Faster, Better, Smarter, Easier, Not Harder. You can learn this and many more things by joining Skillshare. This video by the infographic show point is that without schooling, education couldn't occur. Yet here they are, in that very video, running an ad for a non-schooling platform for education, proving our point that education can be provided outside of the Prussian model of schooling. As if that weren't bad enough, the video is meant to educate people on why we need schools outside of a school. The video detonates its own argument twice. Once through running an ad for a non-school education platform and another by the video's own existence, educating people outside of a school. Fundamentally, we limit our thinking by assuming that just because we've been educated one way, that it has to be that way for all time. There's a better way, one that if you're watching this video, you're participating in it right now. I don't know how best to educate people. I don't know what the best system should be or even if certain people should be educated. For all I know, they're better off apprenticing themselves at a young age and getting into a trade. If I did know, that wouldn't be an argument against government schooling and instead be an argument for making me the supreme authority on education. All I know 
is that no such supreme authority exists who isn't God, and anyone who claims to be is speaking in arrogance. For all I know, the Prussian model might actually be the best way to educate people, but the only way to find out is to subject the hot iron of learning to the hammer of consumers and the anvil of the free market. I cannot keep stressing the importance of adding value to people with wants and needs. We need a free and open marketplace of ideas to test out the best possible methods to bring the most value to the most people, but we cannot efficiently do this when a monolithic state needs to perpetuate itself in the minds of the innocent. What do you all think? Are there other ideas we have left out that would compete well with state education? What kinds of innovation would we have if a coercive monopoly on force wasn't indoctrinating our youth? Like this video, comment down below, and don't forget to share this with everyone else. The heart of education is giving people access to information, so do your part by sharing this and we can really start changing things for the better. So Heretic, thank you for letting me hop in to help you shed some light on this topic. The more nonsense we can debunk, the better. If you ever need help in the future, just close your eyes, clear your mind, and think of the ANCAP eye. I'll just see myself out. Wait, hold on. Where's the door? Oh, just take a right, then circumnavigate the squared circle, and the exit should be right inside of you. If you see the waterfall that goes up and down, you went too far. Alright, I'll see you next time. Check out an Eye for Capitalism's channel. Link in the description. Also, check out my channel, Filthy Heretic. Ooh, Questions? Nice. Comments? Critique? What do you imagine the best system of education would be? Did I unintentionally nominate myself for the supreme authority on education? Support me on Patreon and Ko-Fi. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.